So Rabbi Mordecai here, um, we're still in this process of discovery on building a new economy, which is connected to the series of building a new spiritual society. And we're, we're, we're basically in a way attempting to free ourselves and deprogram ourselves from this understanding of what reality is, the re this, this perception that we were given by a society that was designed to be missing something that was designed. And when I say society, I'm talking about the physical expression of planet earth. According to our saviors that it was designed for us to have a lack. It was designed for in a way that we were supposed to have certain experiences and be able to transcend the limitations of this physical world, right? That, that was the whole thing. So the world has to be missing something. And then the Shims gives us ability to have free will. And then from this free will, we have strength, we have ideas, we have concepts, we have the ability to transcend limitations. We see people do that in their personal lives. We've seen uh, 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 the, the nature, we've seen science, we've seen all these dynamics, we've seen people be able to fly, we've seen people to go to space, we've been, seen people who've overcome diseases, we've seen people who ha have had lives of challenges and achieved great things. This under this idea of transcending reality and re-transcending where I come from, transcending my perception of life, this is where we're at because we're in a new economy. You know, artificial intelligence is, 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 is here. You know, I was warning people about this when I was running for Congress in 2016 that there was gonna be this process of automation that was gonna come and it was gonna happen and it was gonna spread and it was going to take over the infrastructure of the world's economy. And, and many skill set workers are gonna be obsolete and irrelevant. And, and, I, and, and I was out fighting for exactly what we're talking about now, but I didn't have the skills to convey it only to after I came to Eretz Kodesh and I sat in yeshiva, I sat in the base midrash and I learned Gemara, I learned the Mishnah, I learned how to learn, you know, I learned that there is a way that you, a specific way you have to learn and then you learn how to learn and then you spend all your time trying to figure out how to learn and then once you learn how to learn, then you got to figure out what it is that you're actually learning, right? So it's a lot of learning, but the point is the saying that in 2016, I was trying to express the, the, the potential and the challenge of this new reality in secular terms, right? And in order to create a new economy, you have to have new language. And not only do you have to have new language, you have to bring a whole new, like I don't want to use the word philosophy, but you have to bring a, no, a whole new system on how to perceive reality. And the thing about it, I'm not bringing a new system. I'm bringing the oldest system. You know, we're talking about the oldest system that's ever existed in human history. The system that originated creation. The, the system that everything you see now is trying to be a byproduct of. Right? Social structures, religions, all these things are trying to be connected to this narrative. So let's talk about this narrative and deal with perception because, you know, last week, I mean, not last week, the last class, you know, I made a very bold statement. And that very bold statement was that we are taught the entire Torah, Torah in our mother's womb. And that Torah is not just a, a, a book, but it's rather the entire reality that we're going to experience once we leave our mother's womb. That whole idea of fully coming to life, fully realizing the independence of life is a byproduct of the knowledge that we receive in our mother's womb. So when we come out of our mother's womb, we the reality we see when we see those doctors when we want to breastfeed and all those different dynamics, those are that is wisdom of the Torah. That is the information of the Torah that gives us these what we call cognitive skills or perception skills of to even function around it. It's the Torah. And we are battling against this ego that wants to tell us not. So let's learn a little bit about Adam Rishon. Let's start with the first brother, right? The first guy, the first person, the, the first OG, right? So let, let's, let's, let's talk about this person. Where was Adam? Where did Adam come from? How did he get here, right? So the Midrashim say like this. So Adam was created on the sixth day of creation. 
right? Which we know the sixth day of creation is the first of Tishri. And that is, the, that is what we call Rosh Hashanah, right? This is the beginning of this, this new year, this, 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 this process of, 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 of new cycles, of new beginnings is, or at least one of them, right? The, 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 Mishnah, the Mishnah tells us in Rosh Hashanah, actually, that there's actually four new years. We're not going to go into it right now because the whole sugya. But the point is just saying this understanding that one of the new years that we have throughout the year, <laughs> constantly recreating ourselves, right, Hashem, is the first of Tishri. So this is the day that Adam was formed, his body was formed. And so the Midrash tells us that Hashem collected earth, earth to from all parts of the world to shape his arms. Right? So this is how the arms of Adam Rishon was created. This isn't a sci-fi thing, okay? Sci-fi came from the imagination in, in, that is inspired by actual factual experiences that happen in creation. Because the, we live in such a finite reality full of ego that we think everything is just, just like some, some kind of like random set of experiences and everything is just kind of like existing on its own premise. And whenever we want to get rich, rich, religious or spiritual, because we're going through a difficult time, we cry out to God. But as soon as that difficulty is over, we're back, right? So yes, the arms that we have, because we are descendants of Adam, okay? We're learning about the form that we, this physical form that we have right now was first created on Rosh Hashanah. Okay, this spiritual man that would come and can and spread in 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 his lineage would be all throughout the planet Earth first, and then the arms. So the arms. When you look at your arms, the midrash says that it came from from different parts of the world. God went into soil, if you can imagine that, and formed that. Then He took Earth from Babel, and and He formed kind of like our our our, our chest, our our our. Um, our, our, yeah, basically like our, our, our chest, you know, in between uh, um, our legs. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the, from the, in between the head and the legs, the legs and the arms from, from different parts of the world. Babel, which is interesting, why Babel? The, the Shem took land from, from, from that to form our chest area. And from, from, from Eretz Israel, the Holy Land, he, he created Adam's head. So the whole like, head and makshav of Adam comes from Eretz Israel. So this is how you were formed, right? And then he says even further, he says, Hashem placed, placed the earth, Hashem placed the earth, which he may collect in the future. Okay, so when he says, when he says that he, he says Hashem placed the earth, which he will collect in the future on a mishbeach, like in the future, the Mishbeach, that aspect of earth. So the earth that was used to form Adam's head is literally the Temple Mount, right? That area, that dirt that's on the ground, if you can imagine, that was the dirt that was used or the clay that was used to form Adam's head, okay? This is how high the base of Mikdash is. And this should give you an insight that when we talk about things with the Jewish people, um, Israel, Beit Yaakov, when we're talking in that frame, this spiritual lineage goes back to the beginning of time. It's difficult for people to understand that, right? Because they see us, you know, people were Jews today and we don't necessarily refer to ourselves as Israelites. We don't necessarily call ourselves the 12 tribes and we don't have our temple and we don't have our Mishkan and we don't have all these different things. So people look at us and they're like, wait, what's going on? This, this looks a little bit different than the, the what's in the Bible. When I read the, when I read the Tanakh, you know, this what I see here, what you guys are doing, what's in the Tanakh is different. How do I reconcile? Well, let me ask that same person. How do you reconcile what existed during the time of, 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 of Adam, of Noah, of Abraham, Shane and Abraham, all these people that existed? What, how do you reconcile what's in the Tanakh with that? Right? So, so that's where the body comes from. And so this is the part that I want to bring up, right? Because I made this statement about the Malach teaching us the entire future, right? Teaching us the entire Torah, teaching us about Mashiach, being able to see, because when we say the Torah, we're not just saying the five books of Moses, we're saying 
all forms of information and wisdom that Hashem has revealed to humanity, the instructions, that's what we got in our mother's womb. So it says like this, while the figure of Adam was lying motionless on the ground. So imagine this full body, right? You gotta imagine this, this full body being formed, right? This full body being formed. And, and, but there was no soul per se breathed into it. Hashem unrolled before Adam's eyes a vision of the future. So Hashem shows Adam the entire future. And Adam envisioned Noah, he envisioned all the Siddiquim, he visualized Abraham and all the Garim, Yitzhak, and, and, and all those who, who all those who would offer sacrifices at the base of Mikdash, Yaakov, all the future Tamil Chachom, Moshe, and all the humble people, Aaron, all the Kohanim, David and all the future kings, everything Adam Rishon saw. Okay, so the, 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 it's not teaching us about uh, Hashem showing Adam personalities. No, the Midrash is telling us that everything that was going to exist and everything that was going to happen, the complete system of the world from the beginning of time to the end of time, Adam was given the ability to see this. He was given that knowledge, okay? Right? He gave him that knowledge. And that was before he received his neshama, right? This is before, this is before he received. So he was given this intelligence before he was given full life, right? Because Adam wasn't in his mother's womb, right? He was created. So we're talking about this process of recognition, right? And this process of recognition starting with this forming of a body, which happened inside of our mother's womb, right? And then after the forming of this body, this intelligence been given, this, this understanding of the complete system of reality. And then upon birth, this child is actualizing full life. This is exactly the process that the Midrash is telling us. This is what we go through. This is when, the, when, we, when we have other Midrashim saying that Hashem comes and teaches, and then now we're reading another Midrash. And the thing is, you know, people say, you know, the Midrash, you got to analyze it a certain way. I agree, 100%. We're not just holding by the Peshat. We're saying, what is the Midrash trying to tell us? We're doing cross comparison. When we're saying that the Midrash comes and teach a Malak, where do we get that from? Right? I mean, when the Midrash says that a Malak comes and teaches us, where do we get that from? And then when we, when we say that uh, 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 um, Adam... The first man was given all the intelligence of all reality, of all humanity, of everything that would exist. Where are we getting that from? So we're just, we are cross comparing, right? We're understanding what is the mechanism that the Midrash is trying to express to us right now. Not just what it says, what is the mechanism? That's why I could do what I'm doing right now because it's the mechanism of the Midrash, right? What is it trying to reveal to us in this process? What are the steps? What is it building for us? And how relevant or how relative is that to other expressions of the mirror? So right now we're understanding that human beings in their mother's womb were given knowledge of all of reality, everything that will exist. And then when we're born, we go into this process of concealment where that knowledge that was given to us is within us, but we don't attribute it to coming from Hashem, right? When you see kids that just have natural wisdom or they say that you see these kids like, you know, being able to do it, play instruments, you know, and they're like seven years old or, you know, sometimes you have these young prodigy kids and they could memorize all of Shas and these different things. Where does that come from? And is that kid able to recognize that that's a gift from God versus just the way he is? This concept of this is the way it is, this is the ego. This is the concealment. This is the darkness. It's just the way it is. This is what I can do. This guy can jump really high. This guy can run really fast. This guy can read really fast. This guy can learn different languages. This person has can speak very well. This person, you know, has, has dreams. This per, you know, prophecies come to them, thoughts, whatever, different things. Everyone has a different talent. Right, there's people who have dreams, and those dreams, you know, have real, real life impact. Yeah, you know, they they manifest. People have visions. There's people who come to you and say, "Hey, you know, I had this thought about you." Right, divine inspiration. 
So everyone has something unique about them, but that recognition of that uniqueness is usually muffled and concealed in this concept of it's just the way it is. I, I was like, it's been this way my whole life. And that is a mechanism that's part of this world or this reality of concealment. The world of concealment also has to have a personality, right? Just like we're saying that there is inspiration that gives us thoughts about the future or ideas or, or, or things we want to accomplish or dreams or whatever we have, that's, that's a personality of the environment, right? Because there's some places you can go where you're more inspired and then there's other places where you're not inspired at all. And in fact, you're the opposite of inspiration, right? So again, if we live in the reality of that's just the way it is, we are not even to make that differentiation. We don't even have that to recognize healthy environments versus non-healthy environments, toxic relationships from non-toxic relationships, connection to a shown from being far away from a shown. We don't know. We're just acting on it's just the way it is. And this is the reality of ego. This is the system of ego. This is the challenge that we have in this world is ego, right? This ego that everything is just matter of fact, everything's not interconnected, that I was presented a reality that was perfect for my correction of my soul. None of that. We're not even holding by that. Everything is just the way that it is. It's random. I want to sneak, I want to lie, and I don't think anyone sees me. I don't think Hashem knows. I don't think that there's din waiting for me as soon as I even think in that way. It's just the way it is. I could get away with it. Who cares? No one's going to find out. And even if they do, hey, at least I got some pleasure. Right? Nope. Lifetime of suffering. So we're we're dealing with that. Right? That, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with this unique understanding that we were given in our mother's womb that goes all the way back to the first man of creation, that we have the same genetic code, the same genetic information of Adam and Hava. We have the same thing. We're the same people. It's not like we're talking about someone else. Okay, we could debate all day. Who are the Israelites? Who descends from the 12 tribes? Who's this? Who this? Who converted? Who's that? Okay, fine. Let's talk about Adam Rishon and the Chava. Let's talk about them. Where are they holding at? Ah, he could see the whole galaxy. Ah, he anything he thought he could manifest. Ah, he brought death into the world. Ah, he 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 understood tshuva. He understood these principles. He did all these things. Him and his wife. They brought life into the world, right? And death. This is how powerful. The genetic information in our, inside of us is. It's right in front of us. But the question is, why don't we look at what makes us unique and we see it as a, is, is a gift from God that I'm supposed to utilize to correct my soul in the soul of humanity? Because all of us are connected to one soul. We're all connected to Adam Rishon. No matter if we're Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, this, whatever we are, we're all connected to Adam Rishon. And as we see, perhaps we represent different body parts, right? That every nation has an aspect of them that is from Adam Rishon. And maybe that's why the Midrashim are being specific about what parts of the world different body parts were taken from, connected to nations, right? So the, the, so, so the thought over here is getting in touch with this idea of uniqueness and feeling okay with it and pulling it out of the context of secular kite, which is like all about, which is all about turning uniqueness into something that's beneficial to industry. And we're expanding that, and we're saying that uniqueness is here for the correction of the soul. My soul and the world soul. Every time we act at our uniqueness, every time we express what makes us unique, we're correcting the soul of the world. 
when we negate who we are, when we block out our uniqueness and we subject ourselves and we pretend we're something we're not and we push ourselves down and we quiet our voice and we do these things, we are now creating damage for the world's correction. It's only through the expression of uniqueness. So you want a proof of that? Hashem wanted us to have an example of this. And so Hashem created the Jewish people. He created B'nai Israel. And B'nai Israel was given certain commandments and certain ways to live. And that was their contribution. It's a revealed contribution to humanity. It's a revealed contribution that they have to specifically do this. And if they don't do it, there's this cosmic punishment that happens. There's a cosmic punishment that happens to B'nai Yaakov when they don't follow Hashem's Raton. So in the same way over here, when we don't follow Hashem's will and Hashem's Raton, and I'm speaking when I say we, I'm talking about the collective Jewish people and all of humanity. When we collectively are not living our uniqueness, we are also suffering the form of punishment. We're also forming a form of, of slavery. We're also experiencing a form of exile. Exile from rut, our true purpose in this world. The reason why we were created in this world, we are in a state of exile. We're in a state of galut, away from living to our state of perfection, fixing our soul. And we're able to understand that and analyze it through the Jewish people. That's what we, that's what this whole thing is. That's why the Jewish people, as they say in the book of Isaiah, a light to the nations. Or a goyim. But what is this light? That you have a unique purpose. That you have a uniqueness. That God created you for a purpose and God gave you the most perfect experience that you needed for your, for your soul. I'm sorry your therapist isn't going to tell you that. I'm sorry the sociologist is going to come up with all these reasons on, on why the economic disparities there and the racism and the sexism and the, the anti-Semitism and, and this and, and, and your parents were neglectory and they weren't there for you and, and this and all these different things and it's terrible. As were the Torah saying, the world and the life that you were given was perfect. It was perfect for your soul's correction. And only the ego, which is manifest, the personality of the ego, the personality of lack, has to come to you and convince you of something different. This is what we're up against. We live in a world that tells people they don't have to be accountable for their averas. Someone else died for them. Someone else died for you. What are you worried about? All you got to do is follow the person who died for your sins. That's all you got to do. <laughs> you just got to, the, the, the person, the, look, look at the personality of an environment of lack, that it literally has a, a, a so-called spiritual mechanism that they say that this person died for your Averas. So you're not hide your Averas anymore. Someone else took them in, 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 in some big trash bag and took them somewhere. So you're not responsible for them anywhere. You, you, you hear that? Billions of people are holding by this. Billions of people are holding by this. But this is an expression of this world of Mahut, the world of, of, of Asiya, okay? This is what the world, this is what this aspect of reality is there. And that same reality can create a Moshe Rabbeinu who spoke to God, the creator of everything, something that's beyond our logic, punning the punning. I mean, you look at, look at the duality, right? It's Rosh Kaddish. Rosh Kodesh, hey, in a few days from now, most, the light of Moshe Rabbeinu came into this world. Five, five days from now, right? Five, six days. It's, it's, it's literally Moshe Rabbeinu's light came in this world 
in Moshe Rabbeinu's light manifested on a higher madrega when his soul ascended to a higher reality. So the same reality or the same physical environment that could produce a Bilam produced a Moshe Rabbeinu. Now the difference between Bilam and Moshe Rabbeinu, my perturbate, there's a whole world of discussions on this, but my point is to say that Moshe Rabbeinu and Bilam were both gifted prophets. But the difference is Moshe had the instruction manual, which is the Torah. So he was able to take that strength and that power and go to a place of purity and holiness as where Bilam took his strength and his power and ingrained it into the tuma of this world, the darkness, the concealment of the personality of this, this physical reality. That's where Bilam gained his strength from. But we needed to have both to understand Moshe Rabbeinu, not to think that he was just a great man. He's so great, right? This is what the, 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 the other, other nations have fell into this reality of believing in man and believing in statues and believing in personalities and, and willing to die for, 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 for nations and, 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 and false ideas, right? This is what the world is holding by, right? So we need to understand the difference between Bilam and Moshe. The difference between rebuilding the base of Mikdash versus, you know, creating a new empire, a new Camelot. It's a big difference. One is steeped in Tuma. One is, brings Kedusha into the world. Why? Because one has instructions called the Torah and the other does not. The European society, the Queen of England, all these people went around and raped, murdered, pillaged, millions of people, wiped out continents of resources, gave loans, stole money, everything. You know what? They're celebrated as if they're sedating. They're celebrated. People are celebrating the, the queen's life. What did she do? What light did she bring into the world? What darkness did she bring into the world? but we celebrate it. This is the world that we live in. The people who are celebrities are, are, are steeped in tuma. Listen to them, they'll tell you. They will tell you their lives and you'll be like, wait, is that Kedusha? How does that align with seven B'nai Noach? That's not, we're not talking about the full system. Let's say seven B'nai Noach. Where are they holding on in terms of that? Immorality is 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 celebrated. It's it's a it's 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 a it's it's something to it's something to look forward to. There's parades, there's festivals, there's music, there's films, there's child there, there's there's child children's films and cartoons designed for immorality. And the brands that promote them, we celebrate those brands as being brands that are there, that are wholesome. Again, this is not about pointing fingers because that is what we've seen in, throughout history. We're not holding by that. We're not holding by, oh my God, we're victims and all these people are doing bad things. Oh my God. No, we're not holding by that. We're holding by this is the way the physical reality has to be in order for us to use the power that God gave us to transcend it. So look at it. Don't judge it. The Torah starts with Bereshis bar Elohim at Hashemayim ve'aretz. In the beginning, God created heavens and earth. Duality. When you think about the formation of Adam, Water, clay, fire, all these things were put into making Adam. We were created with duality. And then we come into a physical world that also has duality. You know what doesn't have duality? The neshama, the soul. The soul is yashar. It's, it's directly connected to Hashem. Now, the physical actions that we do 
determines what that soul receives. But the soul doesn't have a, a desire for tuma. That's only the body. That's only body consciousness. Right? You can see how clearly a person is to their soul versus their body based off of their connection to tuma and cleanliness, these types of things. Right? So over here, we're, 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 we're in reality. We live in a world of duality. The whole world gives mixed messages. Everything. Everything's mixed messages. Even our physical body gives us mixed messages. Why couldn't Hashem just make our body Kodesh? Our body only wants holiness. Our intellect only wants holiness. Why do we have to have just duality where I have to block impure thoughts out of my mind and impure desires? If you have that. If not, if you don't have that, the impure thought, the impure desire, you think that's you. It's your personality. This is your thought. This impure thought, this is who I am. What do you mean? It's not a thought. It's not just a thought that I can say no to. No, it's who I am. I am this impure thought. I am a slut. I am a thief. I am a gangster. I'm a harlot. I'm a liar. That's just what I am. No, that's a thought. You have the ability to say no. Because as Shim says, Bilam did not have those instructions. And neither does most of the world that we live in. So that ability to discern thoughts, whether they're good or bad, is only for people that are in the frame of Ruach. People who have a higher dynamic of existence past the animal desires of human existence, they're the ones who have this ability to make these decisions. The ones who are not are mamish sheep. Mamish, mamish sheep. And they're just walking around the world and they're just being told what to do. They be, believe people died for their sins and they're not high of anything. And they, they, they're, they're controlled by government systems. and They can't do anything because of this and that and all these different reasons and racism and all these different concepts they come up with why I can't do. I can't do nothing because there's racist out here. How many times you heard that at a, at a at a at a at a at a protest? They racist. They holding us down. Or we want rights. We're not getting paid as much as men. Why can't our pictures be in the pro magazines? Why not? We want to be seen too. We have a voice like the goyim. We're like the goyisha women. We want to be in magazines like them. So this is the world we live in. It's all around us. Your choice whether you see it or not. People crying out for outside entities to fix what's internally inside them. If a person has all the knowledge of the world, if a person is a byproduct of Adam Rishon, the greatest expression of God in this physical reality, and they come into this reality and they hold by the Maragdan going into Eretz Israel and say, the giants are too big. They're going to destroy us. This is the mindset that we carry today. And this is the thinking process that does not allow us to reveal what makes us unique. That's it. You have to understand the terrain. Every great general before they go to war Every great general going to war has an excellent understanding of the terrain that he's going to be and his army is going to be engaged in. And his ability to understand this terrain allows him to execute the plans that are going to allow him to be victorious. So we, if we don't understand the terrain that we're in, if we don't understand where we're at and how the reality around it, then we don't believe anything. We'll believe that just going, let's get together and go and kill that person. If we just kill that person, everything's gonna be better. If we just go and blow up this country and we get rid of this plague, these armies, the world's gonna be better. How many people have been destroyed throughout history that we thought, you know, that people thought that if this person was just not here, the world would be better. Keeps happening every generation. 
So what's going on? Who's the new enemy now? Is it Putin? Was it the guy in Iran? Who's the new enemy? China? The Democrats, the Republicans, the KKK, the Black Panthers, Black Lives Matter, who's the enemy today? And if we live in a reality of limited consciousness, if we live in a reality of limited consciousness, someone can come to us and say, hey, you know what? You know why you're empty? You, you know why you're not happy? Happy? Is because that, that person or that law or that individual or that community or that organization, it's because of them. That's why you're suffering. And if you just remove that, you're gonna be happy. You're gonna be able to connect to the life force of a show. I mean, no, no one says that, but that's what's implied, right? And so people have been going to war and murdering each other and being manipulated into it for thousands of years on this premise. Let's go and kill and murder because this is going to remove my problem. I can live and do whatever I want because I lived in a society that told me that someone else died for my sins. So any sin that I commit, it doesn't affect me. I'm good. This guy over there, he died for it. And all I have to do is worship him. And this is the thinking process that created our education institutions, our government, our social structures, our media, our entertainment, our perception of luxury, of happiness, sadness, conflict. Everything was shaped by this, these collective sets of consciousness. But we're seeing over here that the world is an expression of the Torah, right? We're seeing the world as an expression of the Torah. So what's going on? The Torah is good. The, the Torah is powerful. The Torah is all light. Everything is light from the Torah. But the Torah says like this, before the world was created, before the physical world, before there was a Barashish Bar Elohim, God created several things. He created tshuva. He created the Torah. He created tshuva. The, not, not the physical Torah, but the idea of what we're saying that you receive in your mother's womb, this idea of a total understanding of all of reality, a total truth that's in your heart that allows us, when we see the physical Torah that was brought down on Mount Sinai, it triggers us. It invokes us. Why? Because this is part of the creation of the world. And so the, 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 the Midrashim says, Torah, Tshuva, Ganadin, Gehinam, the Kisa Tavol, Beis Migdash, and in the, in the concept of Mashiach, were all created before the world existed. So that means, let's understand that, let's really dig into what the Midrash is saying when they talk about these seven elements. Because these seven elements that the Midrashim are talking about, let's think about it. Okay, so if the Torah was created, there was, there was an instruction manual, okay, for reality, for all of creation, because the creation is an expression of this Torah, right? Everything that we see is an expression of this Torah. The, the star is an expression of Torah. What does it mean? Instructions. What are these instructions? Everything in this reality is connecting us to Hashem. Everything in this reality is allowing us to think of Hashem. Everything that exists is Hashem. You can sit back and you can literally go anywhere in the world and sit anywhere in the world, anywhere. And you could sit there and you can see God's expression in front of you. You're in the middle of the desert, you're gonna see it. You're sitting by an ocean, you're gonna see it. On the top of a mountain, you're gonna see it. But the only way that you can tap into that realization and that understanding is through the physical book to tap into the Torah that's inside you, which is the reality that you're experiencing, to connect yourself and to remove the ego that creates separation, to create in this reality of, of, of Asalut, Asiya, right? From Asalut to Asiya, that reality,
we have to get past the perception of lack and limitation. That's it, you gotta do it. And the more you remove that lack, which is the ego, the more you remove that, the more you see that you have all the power in the universe, that you possess the same power that Adam Rishon has in Chava, Rishon. You have the same power. It's not about great. You are the universe. You are the world. Everything is you. And you know what? That other person, it's the same thing for him. And it's the same thing for her. And it's the same thing for him. And it's the same thing for her. And all these people, are, they're just universes all around you. But the ego makes us perceive that with these limited human beings that have as much ability as the school system told us we did. We have just as much ability as our living environment told us we did. We have just as much ability as our environment. Okay, kids grow up in a, in a crack neighborhood, drug neighborhood. Okay, high majority of them do the same thing. It's such, a, it's such an automatic that when someone makes it out, they make a movie about it, right? He made it from the ghetto. But that is connected to a person breaking past that perception. That perception of limitation that existed in that community, for some reason, Hashem imbued that person with the koach to be able to transition and transcend that environment. This is the koach we receive when we learn the Torah. Everywhere you go, you will see God expressing itself. Even if you're walking down the street and you see a building being built that's being torn down, something was wrong with the blueprints. That's Torah. You don't have the right blueprints, you're never going to build anything. You can keep running around, you can keep convincing yourself that you're smarter than everyone and no one knows, but until you get real and you build a real structure for yourself through the system of the Torah, nothing's gonna be built. It's just kind of, you, you, you may build something like, like I, you know, I, I see these girls, you know, they're here, you know, they're messing around with guys. You know, I, I, it's, it's, you know, it's unfortunate. You know, you see people, you know, Israel is like the wild, wild west. You know, it's like people come here, some people are Jewish. They say they're Jewish, not really Jewish. People who come here to convert, they get sucked into Israeli culture and a lot of people aren't holding, you know, they're not religious. So, you know, you have these girls, they meet these guys and they're not even Jewish. You know, they think they're converting because they're accepted at a Shabbat table to sit there. They think, you know, maybe they have some type of Judaism in them. But they come here and they meet some guy who's just some like lowly, desperate guy or some guy who just wants to sin. And she's hooking up and they're having sex. And I'm sorry, my dear, you are not creating anything. There's, you could go in the mikvah and you could say a bracha, but you are not like the holy people that inspired you to become this, okay? Our legal system that we have for who's Jewish or who's not is to rectify and deal with issues. It's to deal with issues of people who um, maybe are returning back to Judaism that were lost, people who were inspired by Judaism and whatever, but the whole gift of be joining the Jewish people or being Ben Abraham is being able to have this elevated soul, which leads to elevated consciousness. That's the whole thing. You want, you, you want elevated consciousness. That's all you want. You want the life force of Hashem. You want the life force of Hashem. That's what you want. So why are you trying to take a shortcut to get there? Why are you doing exactly the opposite of what God wants you to do? What do you think you're gonna get rewarded with that? I'm, I'm curious, what, what, what do you think is gonna happen? I mean, you obviously don't believe in this, it's fake to you. This whole Jewish thing is fake to you. It's like no other religion, which means you are holding by nefesh. You're holding by nefesh. Because if you listen to the Torah and the Torah forbids these actions, 
and it's a humongous sin, excommunication. Destroying the whole spiritual system, having sex with a non-Jew. The whole system, you're bringing destruction to them and vice versa. So the girl who's a convert who knows enough Torah to go and sit into the shir and if she's going and sleeping with a guy, you, you think she's going to be rewarded with a high soul when she comes out of the mikvah? You think a, you think a soul you think a soul from Shemaim wants to be in that goof, that stinky goof? Full of impurities? You really think that? You're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself. You know, you hear about people like Rachav, Batya, Ruth. You think these people, you think their goose were, were, were filthy? Full of tuna? You don't think they fear the shim in the same way that a girl who grew up in the house of the biggest rabbi? You don't think they fear the shim in the same way? People are fake. And they only have a legal status. So the person who's being intimate with them is not committing a vera. But them and themselves, they're not going to do anything. Okay? They're not in that special group. Okay? They're not. And many of them don't even care. <laughs> they, don't even know what, they don't even know it exists. The nephish consciousness has no idea what I'm saying even exists. Just like in my, my book, Mind of the Black Jew. Like I, I talk about that. Like the things I talk about in this book, don't just because you see the word Jewish has anything to do with the guy you work with. You know what I'm saying? That has a Jewish last name. No, if he keeps the Torah, he stops. He gets what I'm saying. If he doesn't keep the Torah, he, he doesn't connect to anything. You think he's blessed? Because he's a Jewish last name? What? Because he has a network of people he does business with that have the same type of a last name? And he made some money? Some chump change? He does not represent what we represent. He's not a part of it. Neither do whoever that girl is. She's not a part of it. They're there. And everyone has a thing, you know? And, and a lot of times, you know, even Hashem brings the non-Jew to support Jews in certain ways that may, maybe they, they, they may have went into another path of danger, even more danger. So he found a girl that was converting, I guess. I don't know. But the point is just saying, you could go anywhere and you could see God and you can see the Torah. And what stops us from our ability to see it is the ego. That mindset of, it's just this, it's the way it is. How were you created? What was the original expression of where did you come from? What original gifts were given to your ancestor? Torah is teaching us. We have unlimited abilities. We're so incredibly special. And even that girl who's going out and she's sleeping with the guy and she's not even Jewish, even she has the ability to do tshuva. But again, she has a seat what she's doing is wrong. And I don't believe that a person who eventually is going to do tshuva would even do with their, that something like that. But this is what you have, you know, this is, this is, the, this is the reality. You know, imagine, you know, it's interesting you think about it now, like, you know, non-Jews sleeping with Jewish guys and these type of things. Man, you think about it, I mean, this has been going on for a long time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Long time. But this whole thing is about purity. How high can you go? How pure can you go? How much holiness can you go? How much sharing can you do? How much Torah can you give over? How many, how much hesed can you do? Not for the sake of a crowd response. No, to see how high you can go. You know, you talk about this idea that there's nine people who never died and they just went straight to Shemaim. Right? And so there's a mock locus. You know, what does it mean? That they physically went to Shemaim? Or they achieved such a level, such a status within themselves, spiritually, of holiness, it's as if they lived in a reality of Ganadin, 
perfected, that everything they ever desired, it was immediately there. That they were able to see the future, that they were able to, everything you see, Adam Rishon, they were able to achieve that consciousness here to the point that we only know that they went there. We only, they can't describe it because they went, they left. That They're not here, they left. Maybe there's a physical image, but they're in an alternate reality, an alternate universe. That exists. Do you want to play in that game? Or do you want some guy who's committing a sin? to be with you and destroying your whole chance of connecting to God in the right way. Which one do you want? You want to be employee of the year? You want to get a reward working 60 years, 20 years, 30 years in place? He was the hardest worker. She was the hardest worker. What does that have to do with your soul's correction? What does that have to do with you expressing your uniqueness in this world? What does that have to do with you healing the world's neshama, correcting your neshama? What does it matter? You have 15 degrees. And I'm not talking about 15 degrees in terms of temperature. You have your academic degrees, 15 of them, 10 of them, 11, three, whatever. You're super duper professor, educated, master of clinical science. So what does that have to do with your soul? What does that have to do with your potential? What does it have to do with why you were created? How many people become lawyers because that's what their parents said they should do? Doctors. How many people became teachers? Because my, my family was teachers. Let's get let's get somewhere real. You know, let's get to a real space, and um, let's get to a real space, a real place, and 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 really, you know, to start to start working on life. You know, to start working on really looking and saying, like, what is my uniqueness? What is it? I mean, we're talking about it on a very general level, but you specifically listening to this, what is your uniqueness? Spin this Rosh Kodesh or whenever you're hearing this or this whole month and think about what makes me unique in this world. Write it down. Write down your talents. Write it down when you first learned about your talents. Right? If I was giving a workshop, there would be like a, a workbook. You know, to give you time to really spend time to think about it. The first time you realized you knew how to draw. What was that like? The first time you realized you loved clothes and dressing up. What were the conditions that you learned about that from? Or being inspired by nature. The first time you went swimming. The first time you went bike riding. Things that you enjoy. The first time you had a dream about what you were supposed to be and things you were supposed to accomplish. New dreams and old dreams. We have to be aware of those because we've, we don't live in a reality that nurtures this part of ourselves. And it's sad, right? Because so many souls leave this world not completed. The sages say, like people leave this world with their bellies half filled, meaning they didn't partake in all the pleasures that Hashem had allotted for them. So let's build off of it. Who are we? What makes us unique? Because now we have this system of social media and we have video, viral videos and all types of contents of life expression that could be shared all over the world to people, and inspiring people, connecting with people, creating friendships, maybe even bartering, trade, knowledge of health, how to improve one's life, society, relationships. All of us have wisdom. All of us have, all of us have Torah inside of us. It's our job to ignite it and assume with artificial, tech, artificial intelligence and all the new technologies is forcing us in a place where we're forced to use our brains and not our bodies anymore.
to sustain our lives. We're getting closer and closer to Rabbi Nachman's vision of a society with one consciousness. And the one consciousness is a reflection of us removing all forms of ego. Where we see that the only thing we want is Hashem. We only want the life force of Hashem. And all the little games that we play with ourselves and little stories that we, 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 we create about what life is and who we are and what we're dealing with and all the false information about who we are from a society that never addresses the soul. So therefore it only could be, things can only be imperfect. Things can only be unjust and that there's no centralized purpose for all of our existence. Baruch Atah Adonai Le'olam, Amen Ve'Amen.